the journey through data visualization uh, to the front end, and now I mostly work on anything that touches JavaScript and doesn't touch CSS. Um, I always love testing, so after you know, working in a couple of companies, I landed at uh, Cypress.io. Cypress is fast and easy testing for anything that runs in a browser. It's framework agnostic. We only work through the DOM and through the network. We don't actually depend on any um, uh, framework-specific details, so you can test anything. We are very, very small. We are based in a couple of cities, mostly Atlanta. I live in Boston, but we also have a couple of people in Philly and LA. And most importantly, I do have a couple of Cypress t-shirts, and they're here, hidden behind the stage. You have to fight me to get them. <laughs> now, I, all you have to do to get one is to be fast after the presentation, give me a high five, and promise to use uh, Cypress for your testing. <laughs> well, if you're already using, then you already have a t-shirt, no? <laughs> yeah, you have a VIP treatment then. Um, my presentation will have four parts. I'll talk about the testing pyramid, because every testing talk has to talk about the testing pyramid. I'll then move to why end-to-end -end testing solutions right now do not really work, and why do we have to have something new. I'll do a short Cypress demo. I'm not selling anything. Cypress is open source, MIT license, so if you want to give me money, give it to me, but I'm not selling it. You can, you can have it. But the most exciting part is the part number four, where I'll show a couple of things we're working on. And I think these couple of things are really exciting, because I'm sure that in the next one or two years, every testing tool will have to have those four things in order for you to actually use it and, and find it um, useful. OK, the testing pyramid. At the bottom, you have a lot of unit tests. In the middle, you have a couple of integration tests or component tests where you start putting things together. And on the top, the very, very top, you have a few end-to-end -end tests. Now, the shape of this pyramid is not determined by the usefulness of a test. We write a lot of unit tests at the bottom. That's why the bottom is so wide, only because the tools we have today make it so easy to write unit tests. You have excellent unit testing framework in every languages. In JavaScript, you have a bunch of you know, Mocha, Ava, QUnit, all these testing frameworks that make it exceptionally easy to write unit tests. Now, to write end-to-end -end tests is really hard, but it's really useful. But we don't write as many because we don't have good tools. So the shape of a pyramid that you know, traditionally has a wide base, I want to change. So instead of concentrating on small pieces, like I do test my code on unit test level, but instead of that, because I don't find unit tests that useful, right? Like everything is working by itself. <laughs> I, I like this one. <laughs> um, things become more interesting when you actually start putting things together, when you start putting a couple of components together. Maybe you're putting your front end together, but you're marking the API. Maybe you're putting your server, but you're marking the outside calls. Right now, you're trying to, put, to see how the two components work together. Maybe it's like your code with a library. Maybe it's a code from your team with a code from another team. Um, think like enzyme full rendering. Instead of doing shallow rendering and concentrating on just your component, you're now trying to render a component with its data and see how it renders its children. And it's useful, because while unit tests might pass and everything seems to be working, integration, you know, kind of... <laughs> shows you. I, I, <laughs> there are so many good gifts. I mean. OK. So Ken Sidads wrote a very good blog post where he says, like, write tests, not too many, mostly integration. It's not his idea. This idea comes from a tweet by Guillermo Rauch. It's a guy behind Socket.io, Next.js, now Hyperterm. And I, you know, I love Guillermo. But this is the first time this tweet appears in this presentation, and it will appear two more times after this. And every time it, this tweet appears, I will argue against it. Because I don't think Guillermo is actually aiming you know, high enough. So he's aiming at the integration level, right? Where you put components together. But I think the most important test is the test for your complete system. Because you are a user. You open your browser, you go to Amazon.com, 
You find an item, you add it to the cart, then you pay, and you get the item. What's most important for you? A unit test? No. An integration test for the cart widget? No. You care only about the whole transaction, running in a real system with a real browser and actually doing what you wanted to accomplish. Here's an interesting experiment. Open any website in any browser. Open DevTools, right, and just look how many errors it's throwing constantly, right? So this is New York Times, nothing special, right? All these errors are in a console. Give me any website, and I'll start like playing with it, maybe running a few unexpected edge cases as inputs, maybe you know, throttling the bandwidth, and all of a sudden you will see the websites just start, stop working, right? Even the websites that should be working also throwing exceptions. <laughs> now, to be fair to both websites, I'm, I'm running ad blocker, right? So this is probably because it's blocking some scripts. This is what your website has to deal in the real world. You can't just say, oh, because one script did not load, I'm just going to you know, throw and stop working, right? If a user comes to Amazon.com or New York Times and clicks on a button, and the button doesn't do anything, who cares if it's because of your ad block or because the script did not run in this particular flavor of a browser? The end-to-end -end test fails. Will Klein, who is a happy Cypress user, so happy that he actually made a presentation about Cypress at um, JustConf Iceland in March, he has this great, great quote, and I feel sorry that I did not come up with this quote myself, because I think this describes the modern web perfectly. And he says, don't let your users test your app. If you don't write a lot of end-to-end -end tests that actually keep passing repeatedly, then you know who's testing your application? Your users. Now, you might rely, and you should rely, on crash reporting service so you at least find out about those problems. But in terms of the quality, the impression you give as a company, as a brand, you suffer a loss if your user end users are testing your applications. OK, so enough of that cheat chat. Let's test. Um, so I have my end-to-end -end tests, and I want to have a real browser. I don't, I don't want an emulation of a browser. I don't want to use JSDOM, because JSDOM doesn't have all the APIs. It has its own bugs, and I have plenty of problems working against the real bugs in my code. I don't want to deal with JSDOM bugs. So I want to control a real browser. So um, I guess I'll have to start Selenium and it will go for a specific driver, and then it will send a command to the real browser. Excellent, right? Easy peasy. I'm done. Presentation's over. Uh, my coworker, Jennifer Shahane, gave an excellent presentation recently where she actually found the docs how WebDriver and Selenium work. And, you know, I'm not going to repeat, you know, just go look at her slides, but if you go for a WebDriver, you're not actually running your tests in a real browser. Instead, you're actually sending HTTP request through the server, so your test commands are actually stringified as JSON and are sent to the browser that runs the code and maybe response. Now, you're using a stateless protocol to test a stateful web application. In reality, this leads to slow, flaky tests because you have a black box and you kind of send a message and you hope that it does what you expect it to do but the app might be changing. Your, your JavaScript is you know, applying something, it's doing its thing, there might be loose connections, but you have no idea what's going on because you're kind of sending a message over the wire. <laughs> Literally, it's like this chain link bridge, right? I mean, you can use this, right? Don't get me wrong, but it's not gonna work very, very well. Okay, so instead of using the Selenium and WebDriver, you can get a headless browser, like PhantomJS. Right? And, and then all your problems are solved. You can execute your JavaScript code, you can write, write your testing framework right inside the browser. The only problem is that, I mean, is there a difference between headless browser working versus not working? I, I don't know. You, do, you don't see much. You cannot go and open DevTools and see why the test is failing or how it's failing. OK, so the new kid on the block is Chrome Puppeteer can be run as a headless mode, 
can run in headed mode. You can actually see things. It's a great browser automation uh, tool. Um, two problems. First of all, I can never remember how to spell the word puppeteer, right? Even in this slide, my coworkers had to correct me, said, no, 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 there are no double T. OK. But the second thing, the Chrome Puppeteer is a browser automation tool. It's not a testing tool. In a sense, it gives you this excellent platform with an engine, wheels, you know, steering wheel, transmission, brakes, I hope. But you need a fire truck. Now, you can build a fire truck yourself on top of this platform. But why go into all this trouble? Building a good testing tool is not actually not that easy. Otherwise, we you know, would be all out of jobs. So for a good end-to-end -end testing tool, you want to have a GUI that shows the test that's running. You want to include some assertions. Puppeteer doesn't have any assertions, right? So you want a lot of assertion libraries that understand the specifics of end-to-end -end testing. You want to have automated retries, and I'll show what that means, because that actually makes a lot of difference. You want to record the, the tests running, because you want to observe them later. It's especially important when the tests are running on CI, because if a test fails on CI, you don't want to actually start the test locally just to recreate the failure. You want to see what failed. You want to see screenshots. You want to be able to mock um, network requests, maybe spy on them. You want a good CI support. Right? You want to be able to run that tool on any CI with limited you know, hassle. OK, time for Cypress. So npm install save dev Cypress, like any npm tool, like Jess, Ava. That's it. That's all you have to do. And it goes, installs a module, downloads a binary specific to your operating system. So Cypress is built as Electron app, so that means it can run Everywhere, you download, it, it, it gets downloaded, unzipped, that's it, you're ready to go. It's MIT licensed, and it's open source. So we work on that. Our happy users are working on Cypress and contribute back. Everyone is happy. Mm. A good resource is introduction to Cypress. And a typical test looks exactly like Mocha test. We use BDD syntax, so a test is like it opens the page. And then you have a callback, and everything is chained over Psi global variable that our framework provides. So if you want to visit uh, localhost 3000, you just say Psi visit localhost 3000. Once the page opens, you probably want to grab some element using a selector, and you want to make an assertion. For example, this class new to do element should be visible. So we bundle. Um, Chai, jQuery assertions, we bundle everything. So you don't have to worry about assertions, but you can bring your own as well. Uh, notice that we just stated what we want to happen, but we're actually not running, we're not using async await, we're not running those commands. All we're doing right now is just queuing them up. And Cypress has a queue of commands that it runs. So it's more like RxJS. We like setting up the pipeline and it will run. And we do that because we can do automated retries. We could not do what we can do today using just async await syntax. Um, a longer, more realistic test would be open a page, get an element, then type some text and enter, type some more text, press enter. May maybe then get the list of to-dos and assert that it has two elements. So it's kind of like you know, jQuery, you keep chaining things, and then maybe you get another element, you get, keep chaining things, and you keep chaining commands and assertions. We actually advocate having not a single assertion per test. It's not a unit test. You want to go through the whole scenario, and you will see why this is useful. I think it's time for a live demo. So I have here a to-do app. You know, it's perfect. I can add to do scenarios. Let me make it slightly bigger. I can, you know, add new items. I can delete items. And I have my VS Code. And VS Code um, shows a typical test. It looks just like what I had on the slide. Because we ship TypeScript definitions with Cypress. Um, straight out of a box, even in JavaScript, you should be able to see IntelliSense on every command. 
and um, we have a lot of examples and the links. So it helps, you know, kind of get over that learning curve. So let's look at the first test. Uh, so I'm going to run Cypress npx, uh, npx, Cypress open. Okay. Because it's Electron app, it opens, oh, it opened on a, on a different screen. It shows the list of specs that I have. So I have a short spec. OK, so it just ran my first test. And let me make it slightly bigger. So my website is actually iframed on the right side of the screen. My test that I'm running is showing in a test runner on the left. So my test visited localhost. Um, the web app actually did a XHR, AJAX request, so I, I know about this. And then I got an element with a class new to do. And notice that every time I hover over a command, it tries to highlight the elements if I actually worked with the element at that particular step. So it got an element, and it made an assertion, and assertion passed. So this element is visible. So let me switch and to the second test that adds a couple of to-dos. Now, Cypress is watching my spec files, so it automatically like, reloads and reruns my test as I save my spec files. So I literally sometimes, well, always really, keep Cypress running on one screen and keep my text editor on another screen. And as I work with tests, I can see them rerunning and showing me the new result. So in this case, my test shows that I visited localhost, I grabbed new to do, and I typed learn testing. OK, so at every step, if there was a dump change, Cypress takes a dump snapshot of how that page looked at that particular step. If Cypress notices that the DOM actually changed, now, we're running Electron browser or Chrome browser. Cypress right now is limited to Chromium-based browsers, and Firefox support is coming soon. Cypress can observe your DOM in real time, and it immediately knows when something changes. We're not working over you know, HTTP calls. We're working immediately with your code. So when it notices that the DOM has changed, it saves before and after snapshots. So for every command, like in this case, I type learn testing and it you know, generate enter event, it shows me the DOM before and after. And then my app posted a new to-do and then typed be cool, enter event, and you can see again before and after snapshot. And I can always pause this animation and I can switch to before and after shots. So this is great. I can observe my tests. So then it got to-do list, ally items, and it got two matching elements. And then it made an assertion, and assertion passes. Now, I love browsers. And I love DevTools even more. So why don't we open DevTools? Because it's a real browser. Every time I click on any command, in the DevTools, it actually prints more information. So in this case, I typed be cool, and so I ran a command, and it applied this event to this element. So I actually get actual element references. If, if I notice that my uh, application did AJAX call, I can click on this step to see both the request Right? Typical to do request. I can see the response. So, in this case, my API is really just responding with the object itself. I can look at the headers, everything. So, I can go back and look at each step of a test and see how everything looked and what it did. So, that's why we advocate don't write like a single action and assertion. Just write the whole scenario because you can always debug later. Okay. I mean, this is all cool, but what happens? when we run this test. Ooh, something's not right. See how this is like spinning? And then I see red? So what happened? 
Well, I'm using a database and I'm not resetting it. So this test added two more to-dos, and there were already two to-dos in the database, and now there are four items. Now, I can see that. I can see that it got these four elements. My assertion, timed out retrying to many elements found, found four and expected two, and if I click on this, I can see the actual elements and, and so on. Now, this is the dev developer experience that no, one, no other tool gives you. And I like it. Now, here's what makes Cypress really special. So this is this command, right? It was trying to get um, the list elements, and it timed out. So why don't I increase the timeout? By default, it's like four seconds. But now it's spinning, and it tries to find these elements, and it tries to pass the next assertion, and it can. So it retries getting element, passing assertion, getting element. It knows that things don't happen immediately in web application world. So if I go and I kind of helped it, right? Because it's a real app. So I'm going to, boom. Notice that now this passed. Because it immediately sees that assertion is passing, it doesn't have to wait the whole minute. I almost never see. Cypress wait 30 seconds like you always see in Selenium, right? As soon as the assertion is passing, Cypress knows about it and moves to the next step. Um, another cool thing, so this is typical, and we can do stabbing and, and con con fully control local storage, session storage, cookies, everything. But here's something we give right out of the box. Um, so let me do, instead of npx run, I'm going to do, uh, I mean, Cypress open, I can do just Cypress run. So this is the non-interactive mode. This is what you would do um, on, on your CI, right? So now it runs in a headless mode, and it immediately captures the video, and it, it does everything that you would expect this uh, to happen. Did I? Oh, I, should, I should remove the timeout, otherwise we would be waiting. So Cypress Run is the command you use on your CI. We provide Docker containers, so you don't have to mess with anything. You can just say, you know, based on our image, and all the dependencies will be there. So because my test failed, I can see the failure, right? Um, I can open the video, and you can store those videos as artifacts. Uh, it even took a screenshot on failure. Oh, it's on the wrong screen again. Again. All batteries are included. I only installed Cypress. I did not have to install any other tools. And you can see the video. Now you can immediately understand the reason what happened. So this is a Cypress. Uh, where is my? OK. So we know that we are a real company because a week ago, Egghead.io released the first Cypress full-length uh, course. Um, by uh, Andrew Van Slaars. Andrew used to work for Cypress, so while he worked for us, he recorded a free course about Cypress. So you can just go and watch and find out more. Um, our documentation is excellent. We invested like 25% of our time in updating and expanding the documentation because the projects live or die by their docs, not by their features. Uh, fair question, how do we make money? I mean. We give Cypress away for free. It's not future limited in any way. And we make money by running a SaaS on top of that. And right now, the dashboard can store all your test artifacts, like your videos, your test results, your screenshots. And you will see some other cool things. You don't have to use this, right? You can use Cypress for free. But the dashboard is even free for public projects, only if you want to keep your results private or run on-prem, then you pay. So it's a good model. But here's the exciting part. Here's why, uh, like I worked for, at Cypress for a year. I was a happy user of Cypress for a year before that. But now I'm really excited because there are four things that we're working on that I think will be um, pretty, pretty game changing. Component testing, smart snapshots, test as documentation, and load balancing. So again, this tweet, right? Like concentrate on this middle level. Okay. So what do I need for good component testing? I want to run my component 
you know, as in a real environment as possible. So I need real browser, none of that emulation stuff. I want real thing with real APIs. I want to clean up the state. Cypress cleans up your iframe between each task. So one task cannot affect another test unless you, you want it to. I want to stop the server. I want to mark everything. I want to go back and debug. So in reality, I need the same tool as I use for end-to-end -end testing. You know, we, for end-to-end -end tests, we visited a page, we got an element, and we interacted with it, and then we ran some assertions. How cool it would be if we could import any component from whatever framework we're working on, just a component, not the page, and, and get some kind of mount function that we provide, and just say, mount my component, and now find the login button, click, see what happens. That would be kind of interesting. And what do we get? Well, we get our component running by itself, but you can open DevTools, you can interact, do everything that I showed when you're working with a full page. And you, you realize that my component usually is, is nothing but a mini web application. And the people who realized it, I think, very, very well are people behind Storybook JS. But Cypress has an advantage. Not only are you kind of showing how to use component, you're actually testing the component. And this is this thing in action. So I got a component. I, I'm clicking it. I'm passing assertions. But it's a mini web app. I can actually interact. I can debug it, do everything. You know, we, we spend so much time trying to climb from the bottom of a pyramid, from unit test to component test, but we didn't realize that we can actually slide down from end-to-end -end tests, because going down is always easier, right? Ask gravity. So I wrote a bunch of those adapters for different frameworks. You can grab one of them. All it does, each thing provides mount thing, and then it can test a component from that particular framework. Uh, there is a great video by Josh Justice who shows how he works with a React application and he tests each thing separately. Okay, so use your end-to-end -end test runner to run your component tests. Smart snapshots. So here's my workflow. I see my end-to-end -end test. It's trying to grab this to-do list, and then it timed out, so the element wasn't there. And I was like, why? Well, I... I could open the dev tools, I, I could like, start run the test myself, and, but usually what I first think is like, what has changed in my code, in my data, in my server? And the interesting thing is that in mathematics, the symbol for change is delta, and delta looks like a testing pyramid, and I think it's kind of creepy. <laughs> okay, so my test number 1000 failed, my previous test was successful, so I want to compare the values. Now, I can show like, the full value for passing test and non-passing test by themselves, but it's usually it's too much. We really love, as humans, just concentrating on the difference, right? Our, our vision systems, they concentrate on motion and much better than they concentrate on static things. When you commit using Git, you don't show the whole thing, or you're about to commit this, this 10,000 files, you just show the difference. If you're comparing objects, you can show which properties were added, deleted, changed. When you compare a lot of text, you just show the changes. So imagine you can take screenshots, and Cypress has a built-in screenshot tool. Well, I can actually show you the pixel RGB values and, and just tell you, oh, like, these two values have changed, but it's not very useful, right? So what people are really excited is screenshot diffing. So our friends at Percy.io run the service where it recreates your website and then it actually takes an image and compares it pixel by pixel with previously saved image and highlights what has changed. Because you don't, you don't know, right? Like you want to just see the difference. Now, here's what the smart snapshots will do. So you see the change in pixels. And then you can rewind and you ask yourself, why are the pixels different this time? Well. They're probably different because there is a dumb difference, right? There is a message. And there is style difference. That's why the color has changed. 
So if you had previous dumb snapshots like Cypress has, you can actually figure out that the background has changed and there is a new div. But that's not all. This dumb difference is probably caused by a difference in application behavior before the test, right? If you think about this, right now you can look at the video of a Cypress on a good run and on a failing run, and you can see the surface. But if you had all the events for both test runs, you could do cool things. So imagine you record everything, everything the application has loaded, everything that application has done during the test. You have this giant you know, history of events. And now you can compare good events with bad events. So imagine you have successful run in green, failed test run. The screenshot diffing just tells you right here something was different. But if you compare the histories, you can find where the two runs diverged. For example, API has returned something different from the previous return. How cool would it be if we could actually do this automatically? Because now we can explain why things are different. For this, we have to record everything. Everything. Like, you know, imagine you, all your network requests, all your dumb snapshots, all your application specific events. But I think it's life changing because imagine you come back to your car and you see a scratch. Well, right now, what do you have? You have your error, your probably stack trace, maybe a screenshot. You only see the surface, so to speak. But imagine you have a video of accident. Not only the video of the accident, you have a video of every previously successful parking that, you know, like when you parked without accidents. Imagine you have all the videos and data from the car from your car and from some other car, X. You can find out what really happened. But the question you have to ask yourself, do you really ready to know what really happened? Because it might surprise you. So um, I, I did a version of this, this particular topic at this conference, so you can watch a video and, and look at the slides. Great. Things that don't come from me usually come from the users. So this user, Mike Nichols, tweeted that such a pleasant developer experience with, with Spectrum, I've got a 15-minute video auto-generated by Cypress end-to-end -end test that teaches me everything I need to know about the project. OK, so Spectrum has a big end-to-end -end test, saves the video, and just shows it to new developers. How cool is that? So Mike Nichols is looking into how can I actually use that for any project. So he wrote a blog post, and of course, he freaking quotes Guilherme. Uh, like, I don't know why. But it would be interesting, right? If you didn't actually you know, generate a giant video, instead you generate a specific video showing a specific feature, and then you could link it back to your, your documentation, your project. And I think this changes the value of testing in general. We write unit tests because they're useful for us as developers. The, end, the users don't care. The product owner, managers, salespeople, marketing people, they care zero about unit tests. Now, they would care about end-to-end -end tests if they actually see the value. The value of a video showing a feature in action is incredible because now that's the status of a project. So usually when you have a project, you have use cases that you come up, or project, or product owner comes up, and people come up from marketing research. Let's say user logs in, user changes primary email, user can find an item. You can just write like one-to-one end-to-end tests that show this particular feature in action. Each use case then, through corresponding end-to-end tests, generates its own video. And this is mind-changing because this will remove the, my least favorite aspect of programming experience. When someone asks, like, when is this feature going to be ready? And I have to give an estimate. And it's always a guess. And my definition of ready is I pushed the code. Everyone else's definition of when the feature is ready is when you can actually use it in production. Now, if I show a video of this test passing in production and being stable and green for a while, I'm ready. 
This removes my imposter syndrome of telling people one week, one month, and then six months later, still working on it. What, what's the status of the project? Well, here's my dashboard of all my tests and all my videos. This is what, what's working right now. You don't have to ask me for estimates, just ask me for a demo. And if I can say, I don't know, right? When I, have, when I remove this angry interaction with my you know, boss or coworker, caused by estimates, I can just be very happy. I can just pick up my towel and go to the beach because everything is done. And I think this is going to be great. And someone who comes up with a good way of removing project estimates and replacing them with a status based on actual passing end-to-end -end tests deserves like a Nobel Peace Prize or something. Finally, load balancing. So one thing about this tweet bothered me, and that's 15-minute test, right? I don't want to wait for my end-to-end -end tests to finish in 15 minutes. Like, you see, the Cypress runs as quick as possible. For, for some of the apps, it actually runs too fast, and like, the framework doesn't keep up, but there are ways around it. But 15 minutes is way too long, right? I, I can't wait 15 minutes. If I have to wait for 15 minutes, I'll go and get myself coffee, and that's it, I forgot about the project. So we're working on a feature called load balancing. And instead of running Cypress Run and sending results to the dashboard, you can just add a flag called parallel. And on your CI, you just have to increase the number of CI boxes. If you're running Circle, for example, you can just change this number from one to two to three, whatever. 10, right? And you'll get 10 CI boxes all running this command in parallel. And what's cool is that if you have, let's say, 10 spec files, the first CI box will get the first spec, and the second CI box will automatically get the second spec because it knows that someone's already, you know, has claimed the first spec. And the first CI box will get the third spec, and so on. And so everything, as soon as a spec is finished, the CI will pick up the next um, spec to run. So in round robin, you go through all the 10 specs, but at a speed up of four. So you allocate more CI boxes, your test will run faster. You can run specs alphabetically. You can run based on historical timings, maybe run short specs first, so you get um, results faster. But the thing, interesting thing is to run previously failed tests, right? Because if you're iterating, you want to rerun the test that just failed, maybe you have fixed them, you want to get the status, you want to get the result as soon as possible. So I think running the failed things first is a great scheduling algorithm. You can also run specs maybe affected by the code changes, but in that case you have to solve a problem of how you keep the track of which specs affect which um, source files. So I think automatic uh, test load balancing without you know, any configuration, just passing a flag, is going to be a great, because it will make test-driven development using end-to-end -end tests possible. It will get the feedback loop from changing the source code, changing the spec files, to getting the results, not on your local machine, but on actual clean CI environment. So much faster, so much more useful. So I want to finish with just a couple of observations. End-to-end -end testing was hard. You had to climb a lot of slippery slopes, so to speak, in order to get a successful system up and running. And once you got the system running, you don't want to touch anything, right? Selenium drove many people to drinking, I think, just because it was flaky, hard to set up, hard to maintain. We're trying to change that. And sometimes when the existing tools are industry standard, but are not good enough, you have to go and rewrite everything from scratch. Like, that's the only choice. You have to experiment. We are not the only company that wrote an end-to-end -end testing tool from scratch. Test Cafe is another example, using a completely different approach, but also avoiding Selenium. Other people are trying to, run, to write end-to-end -end test runner tools based on Puppeteer, for example. But you have to be not afraid of writing your own tool if existing tools are causing too much pain. 
And the future of testing is bright. I showed four things, and out of those four things, component testing is already out there. You can try it, you can run it, you can submit bugs, pull requests. It, it's there. It's, it's working. Uh, we're planning how to do smart snapshots, the things that use the previous test history in order to quickly point out the problem. The test as documentation is, right now, we're doing proofs of concepts, right? And load balancing is going to be released very, very soon, in the next maybe a couple of weeks. We're almost there. So that, that's, that's almost here. So out of four interesting things, two are already here, and the rest will happen. So you can find my slides at the link. You can find Cypress on GitHub. Go star it. It will allow more people to discover this. Go contribute. It's an open source project, and we love each and every one of our contributors. And on Monday, please go back to work. You know, drink that cup of coffee or whatever you do in the morning. But then the next thing, try Cypress, because your users will thank you, just like I want to thank you today. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Let's see if we have some interesting questions. So the first question, have you already looked at getting Cypress to work with Firefox and Explorer? Yes. So Firefox support is almost done. We just need to finish the last few end-to-end -end tests that are failing. But you can actually see the, the pull request for Firefox. IE, not going to happen anytime soon. But someone offered a bounty. Whoever adds IE support will get $15, so, <laughs> yeah. OK, and this is the one thing I guess probably is quite interesting to a lot of people. How do you spend the end-to-end -end test across multiple devices? What if you need to test mobile, back-end, desktop? So Cypress can run against your API. It's really good for giving a GUI to your API test. For mobile, after Firefox, we we're considering looking at mobile Safari and mobile Android browsers because they're more open, so we can actually control them. So it is probably possible, but not anytime soon. So don't get your hopes up. OK, and this one is also quite interesting. So you showed us that in the future we'll be able to Flying detect cars. changes and, <laughs> and then create out of it the whole kind of history why this change happened. So would it be possible to just record the steps of a user and create tests out of it? Uh, absolutely. So other people suggested that idea. I, I don't see why not. Um, we, we actually give a GUI for like selector things, like a wizard. So whoever writes a more wizardy thing that can actually record the user actions and convert to end-to-end -end tests. I mean, the syntax is there. It's pretty yeah. uniform. So I think it's... It's a great user space feature. Like it doesn't have to be a core Cypress thing that we have to do. Yes. Right? It can be add on what you add. Because that would save a lot of time for the users. It will save a huge amount of time and pain. Okay, and is Cypress just limited to JavaScript? So you can write your test in CoffeeScript, anything that can be transpiled to JavaScript. Other people wrote a preprocess from the Cucumber syntax. So you can write in anything. Just Somehow you have to transpile into JavaScript commands. What about languages that don't naturally transpile to JavaScript? Would it be, is it planned maybe to have it for, I don't know, Java, C Sharp, Ruby, Python? I, I think it's possible. Um, the one thing about you know, Cypress and why I like JavaScript, or TypeScript if you want, is that the developers who you probably are using JavaScript or TypeScript are actually working on a the code, they should be the ones writing end-to-end -end tests. Like, why do you have to have someone from QA department come back later? So I think the closeness between the development and testing is, gives you unique advantages. And for that, you need a language that runs in a browser, like VBScript. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you again for a great speech. Thank you. Thanks.